Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Yes, well, uh, you know, again, I, I agree with everything that's been said ahead of time. Uh, the, the treat to target means prove it. Prove things are working, and, and especially even if it's diet or, or whatever, prove it's working. Look and see. Make sure it's making a difference. So, um, two case scenarios. Well, the first is a 19-year-old male diagnosed with moderately severe pan ulcerative colitis two years ago. He got better with prednisone, but he can't get off prednisone, maximizes mesalamine. And his pediatric GI conveniently told him that if we give him azathioprine or 6-MP, he will get a fatal lymphoma. We all know this, right? Right? Because how many times do we see this? But that's what they are telling our patients. He's a freshman at the University of Remote USA, and he won't give himself shots, and yes, we've asked. Uh, case scenario number two, a 47-year-old female left-sided colitis while she was pregnant. Uh, and during her second pregnancy, and she really been on and off steroids despite maximal mesalamine, topical mesalamine, she had left-sided colitis, even dose-optimized azathioprine. She tried infliximab, but she really only had a partial response, and she dose-escalated 10 mg per kg every six weeks, good levels, no antibodies. Then her doctor switched her to vedolizumab uh, nine months ago, never really got into response. They even went up to uh, every four-week dosing um, uh, at month six. And you, she doesn't have C. diff, she doesn't have CMV, we scoped her, she still has moderately severe ulcerative colitis. So these are two patient scenarios that probably are not very uncommon for all of us. So you keep on going to lectures, say, well, how do you treat mild to mild, I mean, moderate severe ulcerative colitis? Um, you want to optimize your doses, you check levels, combination therapy, as was mentioned. But look at the last one. If someone's failing an agent, change the mechanism of action. And we wouldn't have had this lecture a few years ago because he only had one mechanism of action and, and we'd be done. You'd have lunch. But <laughs> that's not the case right now. So in 2018, uh, the FDA approved the first JAK inhibitor. Don't you love when people throw in acronyms? You don't know what the heck they mean because I have no idea. So uh, JAK stands for Janus kinase. And it turns out there are four members of the Janus kinase family, uh, numbers one, number two, and number three. And then, of course, just to keep us guessing, uh, they don't have number four, it's tyrosine kinase, right? You're like, oh, no. Uh, so this cartoon, uh, I'm going to go into a little more detail on the next slide. Steve showed a little bit of this, too. But um, there's a pathway where a cytokine binds to whatever its receptor, and that activates this pathway. And let me show you over here. So let's say you have a cytokine, uh, TNF or IL-12 or some chemical that's causing inflammation. We all know that we want to block this, the drug from reaching the receptor. I mean, that's what almost all the therapies we have so far are, either to bind to the receptors or to bind to the drug. But what happens when that drug does reach the receptor? Well, when it reaches the receptor on the cell surface, it activates inside the cell the Janus kinase pathway. And they then phosphorylate the JAK. So they take, remember, the ATP becomes ADP. It takes the phosphate group, right? So it takes the phosphate. It gets phosphorylated. And they recruit what are called stat proteins, OK? So you see the top part of this cartoon there. The stats are the pink on the, on the bottom there. And then subsequently, the stats are phosphorylated. And they go to the nucleus. So the stat sends the signal, whatever the drug is that you're doing to block, that signal is transmitted by STAT to the nucleus of the cell, and it alters gene transcription. Okay, and this can actually cause um, inflammation. So every, most every uh, of the agents that you're used to using um, that are targeting receptors are actually working intracellularly by this JAK stat pathway. So this is not really a new concept. This is how all the medicines um, that we've been looking at have been working by blocking the, 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 uh, the cytokine reaching the receptor or blocking the receptor. But once it gets to the receptor, what happens on the inside? So this is the next phase. It's really quite exciting. Um, and then there, I mentioned there were three JAK proteins and a fourth one called tyrosine kinase. It turns out that different cytokines target different ones. Um, you will be tested on this. Uh, and uh, you can... Eh, yeah. This thing, you're paying attention. Uh, look at all that, that alphabet of interleukins and other cytokines, and there's different pathways. So there's different functions for each JAK protein. And what I want to point out to you is all the way over here on the right side of the slide, it turns out that if you block JAK2, it interferes with erythropoiesis and myelopoiesis. And so we're, we're probably not going to be very interested 
in inflammatory bowel diseases versus perhaps uh, leukemia of blocking a JAK2, but the JAK1s and 3s are particularly uh, inflammatory and they have different mechanisms here. So why do they, these a big deal? Number one, they're oral administration. You're back to pills. Number two, it's not a protein. What do you care if it's a protein? Well, guess what? We learned that patients, sick, patients with colitis who get a protein like infliximab, you can't find it in their blood, you can't find antibodies, it's in their stool. So the sick patients are actually just like they, they lose their other proteins in their stool and get you know, protein deficient, antithrombin 3, et cetera, too. They're, they're losing the, a lot of the biologics in their stool. So this is not a protein. It's, it theoretically should not happen. And it works intracellularly. Um, as you already heard, um, the first JAK inhibitor was approved for ulcerative colitis. It's called tofacitinib, the uh, brand name is Giselle Jans, and it's previously FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. So you can even tell the patients there are commercials for it. Uh, this is a non ah, right, exactly, you love those commercials, don't they? Actually, well, maybe we should make one of those. We can like pirate it in to the, to the um, NBC or something. So it's an, a non-selective JAK inhibitor. So what does non-selective mean? It, it does block JAK1, 2, and 3, but mostly JAK3, somewhat of JAK1, and minimally of JAK2. Because remember, JAK2 we probably don't want to block um, because of uh, the erythropoiesis and, and uh, myelopoiesis functions that it has. So uh, there have been trials in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. They're called the, in the ulcerative colitis the octave trials. The patients had to fail only one thing, steroids or thiopurines or an anti-TNF. And the, the initial induction was an eight-week trial. So here are the results. The drug is in red, placebo is in gray. This is after eight weeks. You can see the, the drug uh, at 10 milligrams uh, twice a day, which is the dose that we're using, had about a 16 to 18% remission rates. Those remission rates are nearly identical to the injectable anti-TNS for ulcerative colitis, by the way. Uh, now, it turns out if you previously had an anti-TNF, you had lower rates of response. So on the left-hand side is the Octave 1 trial. Patients who had previous anti-TNFs, that's the left side of the left side, they actually only had a 12.8% response rate, uh, a remission rate, sorry, but those who did not had a 25% remission rate, and the Octave 2 about same. So if they're naive to anti-TNFs, about a quarter of the patients go into remission. And mucosal healing, the same deal. If they're naive to, to anti-TNFs, over a third of them heal their mucosa versus um, if they had prior anti-TNFs. So those were the induction. That means after eight weeks. So in the clinical trials, you got either 10 mg twice a day or placebo for eight weeks. And if you responded, even if you responded to placebo, you're still blinded, you then were able to get maintenance therapy. And you can see in the middle of the slide, the three doses, 10 twice a day, which is what we've been uh, indu induced, uh, induction with, five twice a day, or placebo, and it went out to about a year. Okay, so here is the one year, 52 week remission data in the responders. As Steve mentioned, only the responders went on, and you can see the 10 milligram twice a day, you had 40.6% remission rate at one year, which is pretty good because remember, these patients all failed other things. The five milligram dose wasn't much less, it was 34% too, and, and placebo was very low, so that was a nice, nice study. Um, this is steroid-free remission. Nearly half the patients, 47.3%, with the 10 milligram dose, 35% with the 5 milligram dose, um, sustained steroid-free remission. Okay, so um, looking good. And this is mucosal healing at week 52. Again, nearly half, 45.7% on the higher dose, uh, over a third on the on the middle dose, and and very low on placebo. So it's nice to see that uh, patients who have initial response actually do well out a year out. So how is this labeled? Because this is what you guys can prescribe this as of the uh, last uh, couple of months. It's 10 milligrams uh, twice daily for eight weeks. Then you can drop it to five or keep it 10. Um, it says if, if you're at the 10 milligrams after 16 weeks, if patients are still not well, you should discontinue therapy. And it is advised to use the lowest effective dose to maintain response. So this might be an example where, let's say after you do the induction, you check a fecal cowprotectin. 
or even look at what the scope, either then or so afterwards. And if it looks good, drop them to five. And if you still have some inflammation, maybe keep them at the 10. Okay? If it turns out you have renal or, or hepatic impairment, have the total daily dose. Okay? Uh, just so you know, the, the RA dose is half of this. So the, so, um, the five milligram dose is half of that. And uh, a good question, should you use this in combination with azathioprine, 6-MP, methotrexate, cyclosporine? It is not recommended. So for many of the patients, we're not giving combination therapy. Remember, one of the reasons to give combination therapy with the injectables and infusibles is to prevent antibodies. Well, the, you're not going to make antibodies against an oral agent. So the immunogenicity issues with oral agents uh, are, are not there, and you don't really have an indication to give combined immune suppression. So the safety, I hate when people show big, big tables, so I highlighted what you need to see. You can see the zoster, herpes zoster in the, in the low dose, 1.5%, but in the higher dose, 5%. And presentations earlier showed that they were uh, primarily in older patients, patients who had been on steroids as well, too. Um, the other rates are about the same, a little higher infection rates with the higher dose, nasopharyngitis, overall infection rates as well, too. And then um, this is the long-term safety. The events of zoster within 100 patient years um, for, is about four. So as a result, what's very, very nice is that we now have the recombinant um, vaccine against um, the shingles, uh, and as was talked about earlier today, so we are vaccinating the patients with the recombinant, the newer um, Shingrix um, vaccine. That's one dose, and then a second one two to six months after the first one. What about Crohn's disease? Well, look at the right side of this. This is the clinical response rates. Almost three-quarters of the patients had a response. Isn't that amazing? But look at the placebo response rate, 55.6%, okay? So who owns stock in placebo? Because half the time you're going to get your Crohn's patients to get better. This is the problem with these trials. It, you get a super high placebo rate, um, it means that there's something wrong um, with the entry of the patients in the trial, whatever it may be, because that should not, should not be the case. Uh, subsequently, though, another study also failed to show a benefit over placebo. So uh, good luck trying to get this approved for Crohn's disease. Um, <laughs> the insurers, in my experience, have not been doing it because there have been published negative trials. So all, is not, all hope is not lost. As you heard from some of the earlier presentations, there are other JAK inhibitors. I bolded the ones. Um, that were actually are in, in advanced stages of trials for Crohn's uh, and colitis. Uh, we already talked about tofacitinib, uh, filgotinib, and upadacitinib. Those are um, JAK1 inhibitors. So remember, JAK1, 2, 3, and then tyrosine kinase. Well, specific selective JAK1 inhibitors may or may not be more effective, may or may not be safer than the... Um, non-selective tofacitinib. We'll see. So here's some of the data. In Crohn's disease, phase two, filgotinib, the drug is in red. Placebo is in gray. You can see a very nice clinical remission rate. Um, in phase two, if nearly half the patients with Crohn's disease and response rates in nearly 60%. This is very exciting. It is just a phase two. Phase three is ongoing or I'm coming. And this was the data in patients with Crohn's who are exposed to TINF um, versus naive. So on the left-hand panel are those who are naive to anti-TNF, 60% remission rates. On the right-hand panel, people who had previous TNF, 37%. Same old story. The thing that I find fascinating this is that the remission rates in placebo and the TNF naive were lower than the, than the um, uh, other uh, ones. So it's a little, little it's usually reverse. But nevertheless, the drug works and works better in the TNF non-exposed. And this is the other drug, the other specific JAK1 inhibitor, upadacitinib. Um, and this was tough. Look what we had, had. In order to get into this trial, you had to fail at least two biologics. Okay? So these are the, the, the patients that you send us all the time, <laughs> failing everything. And clinical remission rates, 27%. Okay? 27%. That's really good for uh, a population failing two biologics. And endoscopically, 22%. So not only is it working clinically, but endoscopic as well, too. So in summary, um, tofacitinib is FDA approved for moderate severe ulcerative colitis. Um, it is, it's indicated for both of the cases I told you, patients who have 
been on steroids, patients who've been on immune modulators and or anti-TNFs. So the first case with the boy going off to college you know, in, in University of St. Elsewhere, he won't give himself shots. This is like a no-brainer. The biggest risk is zoster reactivation, and that risk is much lower in young people. Um, and uh, the CDC says to vaccinate everyone over 50 um, uh, for um, shingles, um, patients on immune suppression. Uh, they don't give recommendations for those under 50, but I can tell you, given the, the trials, we're all recommending it for our patients who are starting on or may start on this agent. So thank you very much for your attention.